but purely by virtue of that. Even though it's the case that, well, if you go and numerically do it with, it, with, with this, uh, you get a more or less the same result. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation and for the discussion. Okay, now we are reaching a special moment. Okay. So, but before reaching the new special moment, I also wanted to give you, if you can, a kind of automatic uh, vision of the problem of the models and model based reasoning and so on. So, to make an example, this problem is also a problem that is present in logic, starting from inconsistent premises and reaching, uh, reaching good results. So this means that, for instance, to make an example, uh, this morning I am uh, reading the topics of uh, the future NDR 015 conference in June of the next year that I quoted at the, at the end of my presentation. We that just with three lines of the topics. Me too. I was speaking about this, uh, one of these three lines that are models as fictions, distortion, credible world. Second line, models and games of maybe. Third line, ontology of models. But there is also affordances, artifacts, and model reasoning. Brain neuroscience and model reasoning, abduction. Logical, logical analysis related to model reasoning. Inferences, interaction, and duality in logic and language. Visual, spatial, imagistic modeling and visual, simulative modeling, modeling, the role of diagrammatic representation, computational models of visual and uh, simulative reasoning, visual analogy, thought experiments, distributed model based reasoning, and so on, model based reasoning and ethics and semiotics, model based reasoning in engineering and robotics. The title, the title of this workshop is Model, Models and Inferences in Science. The title of the other workshop is Model and uh, Model Based Reasoning in Science and Technology. So there is, we are here in European Union. I, I was using uh, the cell phone like the Prime Minister of Italy, which is always the, cor the current political star. Of European Union. Okay, but I just wanted to tell you that it is a very wide enterprise from the intellectual point of view, the interest in models and differences uh, that touches a very interdisciplinary area, very huge, and well, not necessarily there is, a, uh, it is uh, explicitly present a uh, philosophical or epistemological commitment. But I have to say that always there is an implicit epistemological and philosophical commitment. So philosophy is alive, notwithstanding the fact that some people can think that it is not alive. It is alive also implicitly in the activity of many other people and, uh, and so on. So I told you this. Uh, Aspect. We, we are in the era of globalization, so, so also these things are globalized. So we do not have only results of the European Union or just results of a group of a country of the European Union and so on, but we have the world that is involved in these things, also in Asia, for instance, and uh, so not only in the, in, in the America. Okay, so I told you these aspects also because, as you know, these activities of, of, on models and differences in the field of philosophy of science are related to some funds that we got from the government, the previous one, I have to say, not the Renzi government, 
exactly about models and inferences in science, logical, epistemological, cognitive aspects, cognitive science. And you have seen it. He is uh, totally involved in this uh, matter uh, to study models, the role of models, not necessarily science, but for several words. We have five chairs, so this means that we go ahead, we can go ahead because now we have an, a, a, another model that is related to the fact that maybe you know that in Italy there is the so-called S A S I L F S, that is the, society, the Italian Society for Logic and Philosophy of Science, very old mechanisms. Don't we have uh, this uh, society? But we also have the president of this society, that is Giovanna Corsi. She is present, and so we have also Carlo Cetucci. So we can mix together a kind of celebration of the work of uh, uh, Carlo Cellucci, not necessarily and not only from the point of view of the intellectual point of view, but also as a previous chair uh, of this society in the past. And so there are five people that very quickly that I invite these people to, to come here, okay? We will have a very quick presentation of some aspects uh, of the society, taking advantage okay, in the center because you are the president. Yes. <laughs> so we, we, we will take advantage of the words of Giovanna to, to get some, some ideas about the society and in the last the next few minutes, also some words about Carlo Cenucci, always related to this pragmatic academic aspect uh, related to the society and so on. But now I stop because I'm very set to too many things. But it is the turn of Giovanna, the president. Then we will have also Emily and uh, 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 and also you want to arrive uh, no. so you want to arrive Society of Logic and Philosophy of Science, and with this head on, I am here to offer a tribute to Carlo Cellucci. A tribute, un omaggio, as I would say in Italian, inside a scientific workshop, it's something unusual. Yes, but we all are very happy to do something unusual when we believe in it. And please, don't think that I was the promoter of this event. At most, I was the catalytic agent. Because as soon as I made a few allusions to Cesare Cozzo, to Emiliano, uh, to Lorenzo Magnani, of a possible homage to Cari, I found an immediate and positive response. So here we are. Many thanks to Emiliano. Uh, for, the, for his collaboration and for having hosted us. Well, there is a constellation of reasons at the background of this reunion. The history of Sirius, my personal academic life, the role played by Carlo inside Sirius and inside MPO2, for those who know what it is. <laughs> You see, Sirius is a strange society, a sort of a phoenix that is cyclically reborn. Founded originally in 1920 by Ripwitz, 
then refounded again on December 1950. Then a new statute was approved in March 1972. The year 1972 is very important because a conference took place in Santa Margherita Ligure. President then was Evandro Agazzi, and I met Carlo at that conference. <laughs> Also, Doug Pravitz was present there, and it was his first visit to Italy. Many others followed, I can tell you. Uh, Doug Pravitz would have liked to be present here with us, but some, you know, uh, annoying had problems preventing him from coming to Rome. Anyhow, he asked me, you know, to offer his best saluti and greetings to Carlo, you know, first and to the organizer of the workshop. Well, after Agazzi, the, you know, the, the, the first president in, you know, I think the president in 1972, we had other presidents, Giuliano Toraldo, Ettore Casari, Alberto Pasquinelli, then Maria Luisa Dalla Chiara. And I was secretary when Marisa was president. So I left Sieves as secretary in the hands of Carlo because he then became president. And now that I am president, I'm very glad to initiate my triennium with a tribute to Carlo, and I hope with Carlo's auspices. Carlo has played a big role in the Sims all along the years 70, uh, 72, 90, when he became president, so he played you know, an even bigger role. Always present, with scientific contributions to all the conferences organized by the society. Starting with the Montecatini Conference in October 79, when Carlo gave a talk on a calculus of constructions as a representation of intuitionist logical proofs. I remember a paper that was, at that time, you know, I was a young researcher, it was very difficult to you know, go through. Uh, let me also mention that Doug Pravitz too was present at that conference in Montecatini. So, as I said, Carlo became president in 1990, and his presidency lasted for six years, two mandates, and he devoted many energies to the societies. He organized two important conferences in Lucca and in Rome, and also during his mandate, he was always keen in having scientists, mathematicians, physicists, as members of the society, not only philosophers of science or logicians. Mm -hmm. Well, Carlo, you know, uh, being very active, he promoted a new statute approved in 1995. That statute is the one that regulates the society today. So we are under La Repubblica di Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to that statute in a moment. After Carlo, we had you know, six more presidents up to the myself. On the whole, we can say that Sims is not perceived at the moment as central as it was in my times when I was a young researcher and when Carlo was president. Of course, the scenario is completely different, and Italian researchers in logic and philosophy of science do not need any more a society that opens to them the door to the bigger world. Our researchers, I'm glad to say, are quite able to compete in the bigger world without SIPs. Now it is SIPs who has to find a new mission, maybe with the help of our experienced researchers and to be able to confront itself with other European and non-European societies. The role of SEALs today, well, that's a big question and I have no answer. But I hope that with the help of all the members of the society, you know, SEALs can give a push to the research of logic and philosophy of science in Italy. Going back to Carlo and his statute, an innovative point was that the introduction of the so-called Gruppi di Interesse, research groups. Of course, now we are used to 
to large research groups under Green, FIRB, ERC, all these things that were unknown in those years. Still, we may need micro research groups, people that communicate each other every day and work on a specific problem, maybe seems as a space in this direction. I don't know. But. So when Carlo introduced them, the group of interest, it, it was really innovative. Now maybe they are less innovative, but I believe equally important. So let me express Carlo in the name of the Italian Society of Logical and Philosophical Science, our deep gratitude for the tremendous work you have done and the example you set as a researcher and as president. We wish you many more years of joyful research. Let me add that I received messages from colleagues uh, that, you know, that would have liked to be here with us. Cantini, Minari, Bernini, Enrico Morricone, Marcello D'Agostino, Luigi Campanella, Michele Massonet. So, I mean, so, all, all of these people are present with us now. Okay, so now I think yeah. I have thought of making a list, a list of names. I could add other names, but so this is uh, my list. Jan Brauer, Doug Hilbert, Kurt Gödel, Gerard Genzen, Jacques Bram, William Van Orman Quine, Michael Dammet, Georg Kreisel, Doug Pravitz, George Bulos, Richard Jeffrey, Sol Kripke, Paul Lorenzen, Jaco Hintika, Josef Bokensky, George Hughes, Maxwell Creswell, Hao Wang, Saunders McLean, Raymond Wilder, George Polia, Donald Gillis, Philip Kitcher, Thomas Dimozko, Ruben Hirsch. So this is the list. I have considered the, the names in this list, one by one, and I've asked myself about each name. Here, uh, in the philosophical departments at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Would anyone have uh, pronounced these names? Would anyone uh, have read or studied the works of these um, authors, of these uh, logicians, uh, philosophers, mathematicians? If Carlo Cellucci had not been here, I think no one would have done it. Of course, uh, here uh, um, at um, the University of Rome uh, and the philosophical departments, uh, there have been many excellent and prominent scholars, but uh, Especially in the, in the end of the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, uh, logic, uh, philosophy of logic, philosophy of mathematics, uh, and empirical philosophy would have been almost totally neglected if Carlo Cellucci had not uh, talked to his students about these authors. Of course, uh, he is a uh, we know a severe critic, so he criticized this, uh, the ideas of these authors very sharply. Nevertheless, in uh, lectures, in uh, seminars, these ideas were discussed, also very largely discussed, and so the students uh, learned that they existed. I was one of those students, and I see that there are other uh, persons uh, who were uh, his former students. Uh, so, this is the main reason why I'm talking now. Um, and I think that uh, this uh, uh, didactic contribution was uh, of uh, great uh, precious importance. Of course, much can be said will be said uh, uh, also today, uh, and has been said about uh, uh, the, 
Carlo Cellucci's contribution to logic, philosophy of logic, theory of knowledge, the philosophy of philosophy. If you look, uh, if you go through another list, the list of his publications that you can find on the internet, uh, you will uh, see that uh, the first publication is uh, Categoria Ricorsiva 1964, uh, and the most recent, uh, the most recent uh, is uh, Knowledge, Truth, and Possibility. It will be published in 2014. So it's a philosophical path that extends over uh, 50 years. Uh, Teoria della Dimostrazione, uh, in, published in 1978, is the first uh, book on proof theory in, uh, in Italian. The Thinking Logic that has been already mentioned uh, here is, um, was published last year, uh, proposes a, a <coughs> new conception, naturalistic conception of logic. So everyone who uh, studies this philosophical path can uh, realize uh, how rich, uh, original, courageous, and uh, stimulating it is. But I, I was a student, uh, and uh, so I especially like to emphasize uh, Carlo Cellucci's merits as a teacher. So he's not only a stimulating author of philosophical books and uh, essays, he is a, a very uh, stimulating teacher who is capable to uh, kindle the curiosity of, uh, of the students and to strengthen their thinking, their critical thinking skills. So if uh, uh, Someone asked me today, uh, what is the most uh, important thing that I've learned from uh, Carlo Cellucci's teaching? Well, probably in different uh, moments I would give different answers. <laughs> but but uh, today I would say, uh, the most important thing is how to put into practice uh, the principle that a philosopher ought uh, never uh, to take anything Granted. Uh, so we can uh, we cannot, of course, call into question all our beliefs at the same time. But uh, for each single belief, there is uh, there can be a time in which it ought to to be challenged. So I don't know whether there is time. But if, if there is time, I can illustrate this point with a personal anecdote. Yes, it, it is uh, about uh, myself, of course. When I was uh, uh, working at my uh, degree thesis, my thesis di laurea uh, was about the justification of deduction. And I have already written a long first chapter. And, uh, and <laughs> had given it to my supervisor. Professor Carlo Cerucci. I was anxious, anxiously waiting for his comments, and the day was fixed in which uh, uh, he was to tell me his opinions. And the day came, and it, uh, it came a little as a shock because uh, I remember it was, uh, I think it was in the outside in the park here. Uh, and, um, so my, my thesis was about the justification of deduction. I had written a long first chapter, and uh, <coughs> the first comment of my supervisor caught me completely off guard, because it was, uh, well, but you take for granted that there is such thing as deduction. <laughs> I don't know whether this was just a pedagogical strategy. <laughs> But, uh, well, but, but, but there is no such thing. You haven't uh, shown that there is. <laughs> Read Sextus Empiricus. <laughs> so I was rather upset, as you can imagine, because it was right. Uh, in my chapter, I took for granted that there is such thing as deduction. And I also took for granted that the logician Carlo Cellucci 
would the take for granted <laughs> <laughs> that there is such thing as deduction. But he did not. On the contrary, he challenged this. <coughs> and well, my first reaction, my first tacit reaction, was that uh, this is a, was a very odd provocation because, well, isn't it obvious that there are deductions? But when I, when I rewrote this first chapter and tried to, to, to in a way, attempt a response to this challenge and to provide an argument, I realized that it is, it is uh, not at all easy to provide an argument, an effective argument to the effect <laughs> that there are, there are deductions. So, uh, through this provocative uh, objection, uh, I read Sextus Empiricus, <laughs> and, and I, I, I learned that not even the existence of deductions is obvious. Uh, someone, I think, wrote or said that in, um, the obvious is not obvious, uh, and I think uh, this is my experience of Carlo Cellucci. <laughs> suggested a new research program on which he has already done notable work. I am sure that his new research program will continue to be developed over the coming years and prove very fruitful. <clears throat> the first time that I met Carlo Cellucci uh, at the introduction of uh, Donald Gillies was in 1985. Um, I was immediately interested by his work and recognized him as a philosophical ally and a philosophical inspiration. Um, we were both engaged in reviving the philosophy of mathematics from its dogmatic slumbers. <laughs> I have followed his work over the years. The only books in Italian that I have read um, in those intervening years, though I've read some other articles and small texts, were by Carlo Cellucci, as well as a book by uh, Emiliano Uh I invited uh, uh, Carlo to two, ch two conferences that took place at Penn State. Um, I believe it came to one in the mid-90s mid where I tried to get philosophers of mathematics and historians of mathematics to talk to each other, which we generally succeeded in doing, not without some struggle. <laughs> and that resulted in the Springer um, uh, collection of essays, The Growth of Mathematical Knowledge, where I think there's quite an important essay by Carlo Cellucci, uh, and in English. Um, 
it has meant an enormous amount to me in my professional development to be invited at intervals to conferences in Italy, uh, mostly organized by, by Carlo and his colleagues, um, where I've met uh, people I was very happy to meet, very happy to have interchanges with. And one of the culminations of this was uh, co-editing a collection of essays called Logic and Knowledge, which stemmed from a conference in uh, 2010. In his new book, uh, you get a, a full account of his theory of analysis as amplitude reasoning in which processes of justification and processes of discovery are, are intertwined. <clears throat> and I think he does uh, two very important services for the development of a theory of analysis in this sense. One is that he traces it back to its classical origin. He traces it back in very convincing fashion to texts by Plato and Aristotle. Um, thus, um, uh, showing the the, uh, the long history of this conception of reasoning, uh, which only needs to be revived <coughs> and reconfigured. And he also, um, especially in chapter four of, of that book, sets out many of its most important features in detail. Uh, and I think that one of its most important features is the way in which analytic reasoning both enlarges and constrains the search space when you're trying to solve problems. And I think there's a, a very interesting tension there. Um, so it uh, escapes the, the closed box of the picture of reasoning that uh, Speaking for myself, I came up with as a student and have been trying to break out of <laughs> ever since. So I think that uh, you are very lucky to have Carlo Trilogy in your midst. And uh, I look forward to further uh, collaboration with my Italian colleagues. Thank you. So I will offer to you my mental model of Carlo Trilogy. I don't know if it is coherent or isomorphic with the beta model of Carlo Trilogy, but you know in these things, your meneutical aspects are legitimate, and so the interpretation. So Carlo Trilogy, in my opinion, is my, my model, is a follower of the mentality of the spirit of mother side. That, you know, the philosophy of science was born to learn from science this spirit. And the second aspect, Carlos Lucci, is open minded. <laughs> that it is a virtue in my, from my perspective. So he studied, he studied, he studies logic. Also, in being involved in what I call technical virtuosities, logic, that are constitutive of logic. But notwithstanding this fact, or taking advantage of this fact, he also learned that it is important to not interpret logic as something absolute, as, as something metaphysical, something rigid, because, for example, he is also aware and recently stressed the fact that we have to acknowledge the loss of certainty. That is also uh, an expression of uh, Morris Klein. The loss of certainty that is constitutive of modern science, because in modern science uh, uh, there is a, a change of groups. Uh, this is also related to the history of modern states, of democracy. Uh, it is a kind of important mentality. 
And so you have seen also in this presentation his emphasis on plausibility is related to the problem of uh, loss of the loss of certainty and of course of problem solving. From this point of view, I have I admired his interest also in the history of philosophy and in his stressing some aspect of Aristotle, for instance the presence of uh, the problem solving uh, uh, the theme of problem solving and also I I have seen that uh, it is uh, often quoted Hippocrates of the Chios, not of course. The pre-Euclidean ge geometrician that was strongly committed to, to find the solution to solve geometrical problems before the birth of the classical wonderful model of the uh, rough axiomatic method of the Euclidean geometry. So, I quoted Aristotle to honor Carlo Cellucci and also I quoted Zocchius. I have to say that recently I also uh, had the opportunity to see in a newspaper uh, interview uh, that there are also some deontological suggestions. We can, we can take advantage of these suggestions and uh, not only of the books, of the articles, of the more uh, deeper philosophical uh, um, speculations uh, and thoughts and uh, in this case the, the, there are some deontological suggestions related to the, to the problem of philosophy the thinking philosophy what is the role of philosophy in society there, are some, some criti there is some criticism uh, against uh, uh, the tradition of analytic philosophy the fact that analytic philosophy is a bit uh, you know, the flow is uh, a kind of closed world assumption <laughs> and uh, uh, the fact that uh, from the social uh, point of view uh, the Department of Philosophy uh, face uh, with some problems uh, and so it is a suggestion that we have to come back to uh, think philosophy as a way of thinking very important uh, that we can apply to the world and uh, so I think that, uh, in my opinion, we can accept this stimulation because it is extremely important and it is coherent. I do not have a particular affection with respect to coherence, but in this case, this coherence is always a deity, I have to say, I have to suspect. It is coherent with his intellectual history that touches logic and touches philosophy and uh, more cultural reflections. I have to say, always in the spirit of modern science and also of the neopositivistic and post-positivistic teaching of uh, the Greek philosophers uh, that uh, uh, gave us many contributions. So thanks. Thank you. rubbish <laughs> for material that uh, others wouldn't have but uh, I didn't find anything that I could possibly permit myself to share with you today so um, I, I will, instead I'm going to tell you a little about uh, the book that uh, me and, and Ty and Cesare Corso edited and it's titled From a Realistic Point of View, it says in honor of Carlo Cellucci. And um, the book uh, 
contains essays by scholars who all knew Carlo very well, some of them, some of whom are present here today. And um, how do we get new knowledge? That's the main question that moves uh, a large part of Carlo research and work. And this answer is very neat. Uh, mathematical logic is inadequate to address this problem, so we need a new logic framed into a naturalistic understanding of uh, knowledge and philosophy. And Carlo calls this new approach the heuristic conception. That's explained part of the title from a heuristic point of view. The book is in two parts, which mirror this part of Carlo from logic and mathematical logic to uh, on a naturalistic and heuristic conception of knowledge and philosophy. So the first part contains a group of essays more, di more related to mathematical logic, mathematical knowledge, and truth. Uh, Carlos' critique of mathematical logic is a part of more general critique of Carlos' axiomatic method and uh, of the idea of providing a secure foundation for mathematics. So, in this first group of essays, the, the contributors agree with Carlo, um, Carlos, with some of Carlos' idea, but uh, uh, some of them argue in favor of some authors or some notions or distinctions or viewpoints that Carlo, in a sense, put aside. Uh, in order to develop this new program. Uh, the second part collects essays that develop line of thoughts that uh, addresses uh, some of the main features of Carlos program. And in particular, they deal with the next mathematical objects, uh, the role of amplitude inferences and axiomatization, the continuity between mathematics and empirical sciences, and the naturalistic epistemology. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who contributed to the volume over 14 others, you know. And I would like also to thank Cedric Opso, who co-edited this volume. And enormous thanks also go to Amanda Miller and everybody at Cambridge School of Publishing uh, who brought uh, this book into the world. Of course, this book is incomplete uh, since Carlo is continuing uh, to write and, and now he has additional time and energy to do so. So all, all I can say is that I'm looking forward <coughs> to edit the sequel. <laughs> Thank you. What can I say? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.